Hello, our dear students. I'm glad to congratulate you in your study year. Now you are third year students, and my name is Dr. Maria Brinze. I am head of a department of Propedeutics of Internal Medicine and Physical Rehabilitation. Previous year you had uh, classes from small discipline like care of patients, and from this year you start a very big and very important discipline that named Propedeutics of Internal Medicine. Uh, why it is very important? Because it built for you a basis for your future practice and for your uh, connection with the patients. Not connecting just uh, to the internal medicine, uh, it connecting to the whole medicine. And knowledge from this discipline make for you success uh, in communication with the patients and in your diagnostic skills for any discipline, for any prof medical profession you choose in future. You know that we have uh, now continue of quarantine due to uh, a pandemic of COVID-19 and part of our classes are distant, including lecture. That's why today we start our lecture cycle from Propodeptics of Internal Medicine and our uh, first lecture, it has a very long name like uh, internal medicine in general, propedeptics like an introduction to the clinic of internal medicine, basic concepts, medical ethics and deontology in the clinic of internal medicine, approach to the patient, interviewing, objective examination of patients, instrumental and laboratory methods of evaluation of the patient status. Yes, it's such a long name. It's really a lot of information. More uh, information you get in practical classes with your teacher as theoretical information, as some practical skills. And today we're going to discuss the main basic concepts of introduction to internal medicine or like a synonym proper deptics of internal medicine. Uh, what is internal medicine in general? It is a medical speciality dedicated to the diagnosis and medical treatment of adults. A physician who specializes in internal medicine is referred to as internist. Subspecialities of internal medicine include cardiology or heart disease, cardiovascular disease, endocrinology, hormone disorders, hematology, it's blood disorders, infection disease, gastroenterology or diseases of gut, nephrology or kidney problems, oncology, it is problems with cancer, uh, pulmonology, lung disorders and rheumatology, it is different arthritis and musculoskeletal disorders. All these subspecialities, each one is very big, is very difficult and very important. All of them include in one of the biggest discipline, biggest science in medicine at all. We name it internal medicine. And what is propedeptics? Why propedeptics? Why we use uh, still use this term? It is a historical term for introductory course into the art or science. History of it. Yes, several words about it. The development of internal medicine like a science uh, begins uh, with Thomas Sindeham's concept of disease articulated in 17th century. Sidenham closely observed clinical phenomena at the patient's bedside and con uh, conceived for the first time the possibility of a variety of distinct diseases as opposed of general illness caused by the imbalance of humors, which was the prevailing theory of disease causation. Sindenham's work created a framework for the classification of diseases, which was built upon by François Bosset de Savage, who in 1763 published the first methodical nosology or description of disease symptoms. 
Savages uh, emphasizes symptomatology as the basis of disease classification, since there was no information when available about the causes of disease. From the time of savages until the 20th century, internists could do little to treat diseases. Unlike surgeons who could remove the offending organ, internists has no specific therapies. Most of the treatments that physician could offer to make the patient worse, not better. The mission of the internist skill was the accuracy of his diagnosis and the reliability of his advice about the probable outcome of the disease. Only with the development of disease-specific therapy uh, at the beginning of 20th century did internal medicine become effective in the cure, rather than just the supportive care of patients. As more and more specific medications and courses of therapy become available and the volume of medical knowledge increased, more and more subspecialities devoted to particular organ systems split off, leaving internal medicine and the speciality of physicians dealing with all problems of adult patients. Okay, let's discuss some basic concepts of medicine at all and internal medicine specifically. In general, what is health? Health, it is a state of physical, be attentive in this uh, definition, physical, mental and social well-being in which disease and infirmity are absent. One more time, health is, it is a physical, mental and social well-being, not just physical. And what is disease? Disease, it is a particular abnormal condition that negatively affects the structure or function of all parts uh, of organism. And this is not due to any immediate external injury. Diseases are often known to be medical conditions. They are associated with specific symptoms and signs. And what is diagnostic? Diagnostic, it is a science of methods by which disease is identified. Diagnostic consists of clinical examination of the patient and diagnosis basing. Diagnosis is a short conclusion of a doctor about the essence of disease and patient's condition, expressed in terms of model medical science, and resulted from the examination of the patient. Preliminary diagnosis. We have several types of diagnosis. First of them, it is preliminary. It is based on patient's present complaints, the history of present disease, we name it from Latin anamnesis morbi, the past history, we name it anamnesis vitae, uh, and physical examination data. It is inspection, palpation, percussion, and auscultation. Yes, one more time. We have preliminary diagnosis, uh, one of the main point of all propedeutics to internal medicine. Uh, we have a general examination of the patient. It is interviewing consisting of complaints, consisting of anamnesis morbi and anamnesis vita, uh, and objective examination. After you uh, do everything that you want with the patient without any additional technologies, you have to uh, suspect something. You have to have preliminary uh, diagnosis. This, your suspicion, is preliminary diagnosis. And just after you have some idea what with the patient, just after it you continue your additional examination. It is laboratory and instrumental tests. What is clinical diagnosis? Clinical diagnosis is based on su a subjective examination of patients. Uh, injury complaints, anamnesis morbi and vitor, and objective examination, what was before, and additionally to it, it is physical, instrumental, and laboratory examination. 
final diagnosis, it is based on the subjective examination and treatment or death of patient. The diagnosis has some structure. What the structure? First of all, uh, on the first place, you always put the main disease. What is the main problem uh, of this patient? After the main disease, you should describe complication or result, some results of the main disease. And when you describe everything that was a result or complication uh, of the main disease, you can add something else like concomitant or concurrent disease. It is diseases that are not connected with the main disorder at all. For example, uh, we have uh, an ischemic heart disease or coronary artery disease. Yes, it is the main problem of the patient. On the first place, you put in diagnosis coronary artery disease with the form uh, with if, if it necessary stages or functional classes. After it, you put, uh, if patient, for example, have uh, rhythm disorders, you uh, describe arrhythmia, the type of arrhythmia, the form of arrhythmia, uh, and all classification, because you understand that arrhythmia in this patient, it is a result of coronary artery disease. It is like complication of main disorder. After you describe all complications, for example, you know that this patient has a chronic uh, pancreatitis, for example. Yes, you understand that pancreatitis uh, is not connected to the coronary artery disease. That's why you put it in the last place in your diagnosis, like concomitant disease. Okay, and very important term, it is a symptom. Symptom, it is a sign of the disease and pathological changes in patient's organism. Symptom can be subjective and objective. What's the difference? Subjective symptoms are those that can't be found on examination of the patient. For example, as the most bright uh, example, it is pain. Yes, it is subjective symptom. You can't find pain during objective examination and just patient by his or her feeling can describe uh, you uh, the pain, its character, its localization, intensity and something else. It is subjective symptoms. And what is objective symptom? Uh, it is symptom uh, that can be found on examination. Uh, for example, edema. Let's take edema. Yes, you examine patient and see that uh, legs are edemed. Yes, it is objective symptoms. You can see it like a doctor. You can palpate it like a doctor. Uh, that's why it is objective. Okay, and let's uh, talk a little bit more about symptoms. Yes, we are told that they can be subjective or objective according to uh, can you find it during examination or you can't and you base it just on words of the patient. Uh, symptoms can be favorable, unfavorable. Yes, you understand it. Symptoms can be early or late. It is depending on time of manifestation of these symptoms. Uh, they can be specific or non-specific. For example, um, some specific neurological symptoms that can be just in this case. And you see these symptoms and you suspect some specific disease. And non-specific, like an example, uh, palpitations. Yes, palpitations, it is a uh, wrist heartbeat, uh, and it can be in a huge number of different disorders. Yes, it is the symptoms, but uh, it has a small uh, diagnostic information because you can't suspect what exactly disease can lead to this symptom. Moreover, uh, symptoms can be compensatory, yes, when it is compensate some other disorder or some other situation. 
uh, and symptoms can be uh, physiological or pathological according to is it for example uh, caused by normal physiological reaction or physical uh, physical training or stress or something else or it is pathologically due to some pat pathology Okay, and another term that you can't mix with the symptom, it is syndrome. What is the syndrome? It is defined as combination of symptoms. They are interrelated and give rise to one another. And syndrome complex is defined as symptoms that are not interrelated and do not give rise to one another. Okay, that's why the main difference that symptom it is just some one uh, process or some one uh, uh, thing, and syndrome it is a complex of symptoms that related to something. Yes, you know that, for example, uh, high blood pressure, edema, and proteinuria, uh, it is three symptoms, they are usual for nephrotic syndrome. Yes, that's why uh, you remember about it, and uh, if this symptom complex is uh, usual, you see in the, uh, it in the patient, you uh, suspect uh, nephrotic syndrome like typical complex of symptoms yes another part of our lecture it is ethics and deontology and here i want to speak with you more about it because it is one of the most important thing is met in medicine at all and it is a big problem in modern medicine because uh, the uh, comfort of patient, the quality of life of the patient and the medical process, process of communication with the doctor uh, for today, one of the most important thing in medicine at all. That's why if you're going to be a successful doctor, uh, you must uh, keep all rules of medical and ethics and deontology. First of all, let's give a definition. What is that? What is deontology? It is a professional ethics of medical workers and principles uh, of behavior of medical personnel directed toward maximum benefit of treatment. And what is ethics? It is a study of moral values and judgments and they apply in the medicine. What are the main ethical principles? First, it is beneficence and non-maleficence. It is autonomy and consent. It is truth-telling. It is confidentiality. It is preservation of life and justice. Uh, let's talk more about each one. Uh, beneficence it is the act of doing good it is the main uh, position for you like a doctor yes first of all you should doing good even if sometimes you're doing uh, worse or you're doing pain you do it some discomfort to the patient yes you have to be absolutely sure that it generally for general prognosis you're doing good in opposite situation if you are not sure you do not do anything at all it is the main thing uh, while non maleficence it is acts of not doing bad in practical terms medical practitioners have an ethical responsibility to strive to do what is in the best interest of their patients even if patient don't understand that in the in this moment that it is not in his or her interest uh, you should explain and you should uh, say something uh, for this patient to do this procedure or this treatment or this uh, some medical uh, method methodology however it is important to remember that some medical interventions may seem beneficial but may also carry in them the possibility of causing harm in fact 
nearly all medical treatments and procedures it could be argued harm the patient in some way but it is more to do with the magnitude of the benefit versus the magnitude of potential risk yes first of all you evaluate for yourself risk and benefit you decide that benefit better you do better you're doing good after it you should harm the patient uh, because without patient agreement uh, you can't do anything what is autonomy and consent autonomy it is a right of patient to make an informed and cursed decision about their own health management yes it what i uh, told previously without patient's agreement we can't do anything in this principle it is uh, disregarded by a medical professional because patients believes another decision uh, would be better for, uh, sorry not patient doctor believes another decision would be better for the patient then it is termed paternalism uh, an autonomous decision should never be overruled by a medical professional, but not all decisions are autonomous. For patients to have autonomy, they must have the capacity to receive, retain and repeat information that is given to them, provided the information is complete and given to them in a manner that they can understand. Yes, you understand this term. That for different patient you should find different words how to explain what you're going to do consent it is extension of autonomy that has many times it is implied consent uh, is when a doctor assumes that certain actions or body language from the patient imply the patient has consented to the planned action of the doctor it is expressed oral consent when patients uh, when a patient has a verbally given the doctor permission to proceed with the intended action it is expressed writing consent it is documented evidence that the patient has usually with a signature given the consent to a procedure written consent should only be obtained after oral consent Yes, it is the main thing. If patient is conscientious, if patient is available for some discussion, you always before do something have to uh, get uh, written consent or expressed writing or fully informed consent. And what is fully informed? It is consent given after being given all the information about the procedure. When possible, fully informed consent, both written and oral, should be obtained before any procedure, examination of tre or treatment. Uh, truth telling. The ethical princip uh, principle of truth telling is the process when, in which doctor gives the patient all known information about their health. It allows the patient to be fully informed and therefore allows for the ethical principles of autonomy and consent. A point of note that always needs to be cons uh, considered is the fact that some patients do not want the information. Therefore, it is important to ask the patient if they want to know or not. The only other extremely rare occasion when it is acceptable not to tell the patient the truth is when their patients may come to harm when being told. Uh, for example, if you tell me I have cancer, I will kill myself. Confidentially, the ethical principle of confidentiality ensures that medical information held about patients uh, is acceptable only to those to whom the patient has given access via autonomous or full informed consent. In order to archive a trust between medical uh, professionals and their patients, confidentiality must be maintained. Confidentiality may be broken if information shared by the patient refers to a potential danger to public safety or it is ordered by a court. 
The ethical principle of preservation of life, it is will that treat patients' illness with the aim of prolonging life. After all, most patients want to live longer. Most doctors have, uh, may have joined the profession to save lives. This principle may be overruled if the patient uh, has made a living with starting their desire uh, not be resuscitated. Justice. It refers to the distribution of things and position of people within society. In a medical setting, justice involves the allocation of health care resources in the fair way. This may be the equal distribution or a maximization of the total or overage welfare across the whole society. Okay, and let's start another part of our lecture. It is uh, the basics of all propedeptics and all internal medicine and all medicine at all. And main our goal of this study year. In the uh, end of this study year and this discipline, you have to know how to approach the patient. And first part of it, it is interviewing. The medical interview is a practicing physician most versatile diagnostic and therapeutic tool. However, the interviewing is also one of the most difficult clinical skills to master. Uh, the demands made on the physician are both intellectual and emotional. The analytical skills of diagnostic resourcing must be balanced with the interpersonal skills needed to establish rapport uh, with the patient and facilitate communication. Interviewing is often considered part of the art in contrast to the science of medicine. There are many reasons to dispute this distinction. Perhaps the most compelling that is labeling in an art removes interviewing from a real of critical appraisal and suggests uh, that there is something magical or mysterious about interviewing that can't be described or taught. These chapters uh, will demonstrate the validity of interviewing as a clinical science based on critical observation and analysis of the patient without diminishing its excitement as a clinical activity. It provides a guide of conductual initial interviews and making sense that happens. It will outline the knowledge, attitudes and skills that lead to effective interviewing. The decision will focus on the problem-oriented diagnostic interview, but the health promotion interview and interviews during follow-ups visit will also be managed. mentioned. Nature and goals of the interview most clinicians read the patient's medical history as having greater diagnostic value than rather the phys physical examination or result of laboratory investigation. The clinical adage of about two-thirds of diagnosis can be made on the basis of history alone, has retained its validity despite of technical advances of the modern hospital. The accurate history also provides focus on physical examination, making it more productive and time efficient. Clinical hypotheses generated during the interview provide the basic for a cost-effective utilization of clinical laboratory and other diagnostic modalities. The diagnostic utility of interview is com uh, uh, complemented by its therapeutic power. It is a medium through which a positive relationship is established between the doctor and patient. An empathic, patient-centered interview can bolster the patient's sense of self-esteem and lessen, and feeling the helplessness that often accompany an episode of illness. The therapeutic alliance forged during the clinical encounter provides the foundation for ongoing patient care and education. Uh, fundamentally, the medical interview is a uh, purposeful conversation undertaken with a set of goals and uh, priorities clearly maintained in the physician's mind.
Its direction reflects the perspective needs for both participants, patients and physicians. The patient enters the interview seeking relief from the discomforts and uncertainty of illness. While the physician actively conducts the interview in order to clarify the patient's problems and derive diagnostic and therapeutic plans uh, for the patient's benefit. During the interview, the patients need to have this uh, his or her story had and suffering understood is balanced by the physician's need to know and understand as much as possible about the patient and his or her problems. Uh, the, what the problem oriented and health promotion interview? Medical interviews are two ba uh, basic types the problem oriented and health promotion. The goals of problem oriented interview reflect the patient's request to help with specific problems. The health promotion interview establishes a data baseline concerning the patient's current and past health problems, accesses current health uh, risk factors, uh, for example, smoking, diet, alcohol consumption, heritable disease in the family, etc and can detect early evidence of disease, change in bowel habits, weight loss, chest discomfort, like any examples. Uh, that the patient did not consider severe enough to warrant a problem-specific visit to the doctor. In reality, most medical encounters combine the problem-oriented and health promotion approaches. Issues of health promotion are important to all patients, and patients who come to the doctor for a routine check-up may have hidden concerns about specific symptoms. In fact, careful questioning about why and when the patient schedules a routine check-up often uncovers significant health concerns. Uh, medical interview provides two categories of information available from any other source. What the patient says about the illness and how it, uh, it is said. What the patient tells the physician provides the factual, uh, factual content of medical history. The factual content is what the physician edits and records in a written record, the medical history. It should include a comprehensive chronological report of the patient illness and will enough information, both positive and negative. For accurate and inclusive diagnostic reasoning regarding possible etiologies of the patient problems. The process of the interview, what is actually happens between physician and patient during their encounter. Observation of process, both verbal and nonverbal provides important information about the patient as a person. Through the patient's behavior during the, during the interview, facial expression, posture, gestures, uh, he or she communicates emotional concept, reaction to the illness, style of relating to others, sudden shifts of topic, avoidance of certain issues, and the floor of spontaneous associations may point to concert uh, that are not expressed directly. The physician's communication style and behavior during the interview is also a critical element of interviewing process. The distinction between content and process highlights the dual skills required in the medical interview, analytical and interpersonal. Although these skills can be discussed separately, they must be practiced together. The clarity and validity of information gathered during the interview, its content may be critically determined by the quality of the relationship that develops between patient and physician or its process. Candid disclosure of patient concern is more likely to come about the context and non-judgmental interviewing style. A final comment on process and content may be helpful to the beginning student. The content and organization of the written medical history and often confused with the process by which the clinic, uh, uh, clinician actually collects information during the interview. 
Their writing medical history is actually a journalistic and humor in which the clinician edits and organizes the patient's spontaneous report into a formal organized presentation. The final product in the medical chart may bear little resemblance to the work of clinician performs at the bedside. Patients rarely report their symptoms in an organized and logical fashion comparable to the description of disease in medical texts. In fact, patients complain of illness or sickness rather than state their problems in terms of pathophysiologic categories of disease. Students who expect their patients to present classic symptoms complexes in organized fashion experience considerable, uh, considerable frustration and may become rapidly dis um, uh, disillusionized with clinical medicine. The complaint that the patient was a poor historian may reflect unrealistic expectation on interviewer's part. In clinical practice, the interview is collaborative effort between physician and a patient. Uh, Razor, it is a scientist, state that physician, no matter how skilled, cannot simply extract a history from his patient. The patient, no matter how, to, how articulate, can give a history in final form without help and guidance from the physician. To say what we take a history uh, from the patient implies that the story of illness can be extracted from the patient like shaking a coin from a piggy bank. This uh, uh, erroneous con uh, conception of medical interview leads to frustrated attempts at shaking out the history as if the patient was uh, willfully keeping his valuable coin hidden. Okay, let's discuss some therapeutic tasks and, uh, for example, it is establishing a helping relationship. A helping relationship is cornerstone of medical history to the practice of medicine and medical interview. Uh, this does not occur magically. The physician actively employs interviewing techniques to promote a relationship. Non-judgmental interest in the patient's problem, active listening, empathy, uh, like communication to the patient and accurate assessment of emotional state, and concert to the patient uh, as unique person are among the most important tools in the physician interpersonal uh, repertoire. repertoire. Their uh, techniques uh, not only strengthen the therapeutic bond, then they improve the interview's diagnostic power by providing the patient with attentive and receptive audience. By helping the patient describe a sort of ex experience, the physician can provide explanations and meaning to events and feelings that were formerly uh, perplexing and treating. The patient's sense of control can be re-established in a realistic fashion. The feelings of helplessness and hopelessness can be addressed in the context to the helping relationship. Problems can be reframed and uh, prioritized uh, to help the patient develop his or her own solution. Obviously, the goals of medical interview have much in common with uh, psychotherapy. Furthermore, patients who sense that their story is taken seriously may feel encouraged and become more active participants in their medical care. Patients' uh, compliance and cooperation with future diagnostic and therapeutic plans often hinge on physic physician skill. In developing and negotiating a managing plan that encourages patient involvement and initiating. The method a physician uses to establish rapport uh, differs uh, uh, with each interview. Each encounter is unique. Uh, one patient may respond best to a reassuring touch, one of well-timed interpretation or emotional consents, uh, another to a moment shared silence. Observation of patients' responses serve as a physician's guide to which techniques to employ and provides feedback about when and how to change course. 
Patients demonstrate a remarkable variety of responses to a medical interview reflecting the range of human personality type and responses to illness. Anger, anxiety, the initial vagueness about detail, emotional uh, embellishment, unreasonable expectations or demands are but, uh, but a few of the difficult but common changes in the medical interview. And continue interviewing, uh, you do some objective examination. Physical examination, it is a process of evaluating objective anatomic findings through the use of observation, palpation, percussion and auscultation. And what, what you do objectively with the patient. The information obtained must be uh, thoughtfully integrated with the patient's history and pathophysiology. Moreover, it is a unique situation in which both patient and physician understand that uh, the interaction is intended to be diagnostic and therapeutic. The physical examination through fully performed should yield 20% of the data necessary for patient diagnosis and management. Physician-patient interaction during examination Aside from the hospital room and office, physical examination may occur a variety of other settings where it is difficult to establish privacy and quiet. The best resource available to the physician to set the stage for the physical examination is to communicate respect and genuine interest in the patient's welfare. The patient should be addressed politely and asked to perform the required maneuvers of the examination. A technique far preferable to imperative language, such as I want you to, patients should be prepared for unpleasant portions of the examination. Aside from explanations and uh, resourcefulness, it is not necessary to maintain a continuous conversation with the patient during examination. Avoid embarrassing the patient. Uh, be certain that uh, draping material is used appropriately, that uh, personal areas are not subjected to uh, undue exposure. An examination that ends abruptly may damage the value of the doctor-patient relationship and may destroy its therapeutic content. The patient may um, benefit from the brief summary or relevant findings and may require uh, reassurance about the, that has and has not been found. The materials. The single most useful device for optimal performance of physical examination is an uh, inquisitive and sensitive mind. Next most useful uh, is mastery of techniques of observation, palpation, percussion and auscultation. All these techniques you will uh, practice and you will discuss with your practical teachers. It is uh, your goal for this year. Less important are tools required for examination. What are these tools? Uh, it can be cotton uh, wisps, flashlight, uh, lubricant and jelly, midriatic solution, auto ophthalmoscope, paper towels, pocket eye chart, rectal gloves, reflex hammer, sphygma manometer, stethoscope, tape measure, thermometer, tissues, tongue depressors, uh, tanning fork, uh, wheels of coffee and cinnamon. Yes, first of all, the main tool it is your mind and your skills. And on second place, this additional equipment that you should have in your uh, practice room. The examination. As an environment affects the quality uh, of the phys physical examination, it is wise to arrange the quiet and privacy, darkening room for parts of the examination and comfort of patients and ex examiner. The complete examination should uh, proceed uh, in an orderly fashion with the minimum required position shifts by a patient. Yes, we will uh, discuss it in table 2. 
On the other hand, the physician must be able uh, to uh, ascertain the integrity of the various organ systems from regional examinations. Uh, for instance, from the examination of the head and neck, uh, the physician must identify the vascular, neurologic, lymphatic, skeletal and uh, intergumentary components uh, and must relate them to their complements in other body regions. It would be tedious, by contrast, to examine the vascular system in its in entirety, followed by complete neurologic examination and the other organ system each in turn. Which examining an anatomic region, the observer must be alert to the appearance of any abnormality and question at the time of morphologic aspects of the abnormality and its clinical significance. Okay, what about position and patient's, uh, patient and examiner during physical examination? Yes, uh, it is inspection of head and neck. Patient should be in sitting position, examiner standing before the patient. For anterior torso, patient sitting, physician standing before patient, initially later behind the patient. For posterior torso, patient in sitting position, patient uh, physician at patient's sides. Anterior chest and Abdomen. We ask patient to take a supine position and physician should stay before the patient. Uh, for male genitalia, it is standing position and physician before the patient. For gait, station and coordination, we ask patient uh, to get variable positions and a physician staying behind the patient. And from female genitalia, it is reclining on examination table, draped, knees flexed, and legs adducted feet in uh, stirrups. And physician in this moment sitting on stool at times or standing. The general physical examination can take many forms depending on upper circumstances. Most often, the examining examiner evaluates body regions in a general way, looking for abnormalities. Clues derived from the history signal the need for a more uh, precise and uh, detailed examination of a given system. A through physical examination often include a sequent present, presented in next table. For patient's comfort, a comfort, you should be certain that the patient in a relaxed a position uh, to proper show you this region that you examine in this moment. For optimal environment, the examination surface should be in height appropriate for the examiner. Light sources and uh, certains should be optimally arranged. Television sets, radios and other noisy dissections should be eliminated. Uh, for vital signs and general inspection, evaluate the radial pulse and rate and rhythm, measure brachial blood pressure, inspect nails, skin and hair, note a general appearance, body habits, hair distribution, muscle mass, movement, coordination, odors and breathing patterns. Yes, examination of head, uh, here are included eyes. Uh, it is examination of conjunctiva, sclera, cornea, iris of each eye, test pup uh, pupils from irregularity, accommodation and reaction, evaluate visual fields and visual uh, acuity for cranial nerve 2, access intraocular movements for nerves 3, 4 and 6, test the corneal reflex, it is nerve 5. Ears. Examine the pinea and periauricular tissue. Test auditory uh, acuity. Perform uh, Weber and Rene manoeuvres. It is checking of cranial nerve 8. Uh, you should perform oft uh, ophthalmo otoscopy. In examination of nose, connect the nasal speculum to the otoscope and examine the nares, noting the condition of the mucosa, septum and uh, turbinates. Examination of mouse. You should examine the vermili uh, vermilion border, oral mucosa, tongue, 
identify the salivatory duct papillar, access the uh, dentition for decay, repair, condition or bite. View the pharynx, evaluate the function of cranial uh, nerves uh, 9, 10 and 12. Inappropriate evaluate sensory divisions of cranial nerves 5 and 7. Uh, at face, it is evaluation of symmetry, smile, frown and jaw movements will provide information about motor divisions of cranial nerves 5 and 7. Uh, examination of neck, examination of anterior torso and posterior torso, uh, where you should provide uh, during patient sitting, examine epitrochlear uh, epi uh, and axillary nodes, examine the uh, wrists, define the PMI and examine the heart, having the patient's lean forward if necessary. Uh, moreover, evaluate the vertebral column and cortovertebral areas, auscultate the posterior and lateral lung fields, and evaluate the general uh, chest form and present of different deformations. Uh, completion of seated position of examination. It is evaluating of proximal and distal motor strength, deep tender reflexes, distal pulses and sensations. With the patient supine in thorax region, examine the breast, uh, re-examine the heart, turning the patient to the left lateral uh, decubitus position if appropriate. Auscultate the anterior lying structure. In abdomen, after inspection, auscultate listening for bowel sounds and brutes. Next, inspect percuss and palpate the abdomen, taking special notice of hepatic or splenic enlargements. Proximal lower extremities. Examine the inguinal femoral and popliteal regions for adenopathy and pulses. Evaluate range of motions of hips, knees and ankles. With the patient standing, examine external genitalia for male. In both male and female, evaluation station and gait. Pelvic and rectal examination. In females, the pelvic examination should be performed on an examining table provided with a stri uh, stirrups. Rectal examination and occult blood testing should be done simultaneously. In males, uh, the rectal examination is best performed with the patient in a, a bent forward position. The clinically significant physical examination is flexible entity that should vary the knees of the patient. Periodic examinations or for health assessment need to be comprehensive as do most hospital admissions examinations. In contrast, it will not be cost effective to undertake a complete physical examination in most patients presenting with symptoms uh, of an upper respiratory infection or urinary tract infection. Because of large degree uh, of variability in uh, observing, the following recommendation can made uh, when reporting and interpreting physical findings. First, it is emphasis should be placed on uh, dichotomous variables, presence or absence of rails, rather than on graded variables, intensity of breeze sounds. Second, some physical signs, for example, clubbing of fingers, represent a continuum from obviously normal uh, to obviously abnormal. Emphasis should be placed on those findings which represent the extreme rather than borderline cases. Recognition of those physical findings which have high degree of inter-observer uh, variability is important. Good examples uh, in this include detection of moderate or small amounts of acetic fluid and detection of diaphragmatic movement by percussion. These findings should be de-emphasized in favor of those the better reproducibility. And fourth one, it is beneficial to use the body's symmetry to advantage. Differences auscultated in breath sounds between similar area of the right and left lung are far more clinically important than an overall decrease in, in breath sounds. 
instrumental and laboratory methods of evaluating of patient status. Yes, I told you that they are additional after objective examination. Till this moment, you have to have some preliminary diagnosis. It is some idea uh, what uh, the problem in this patient. And you confirm it, first of all, with laboratory tests. Laboratory tests include a range of blood and urine tests. Blood work may include testing for genetics, inherited disorders, or to determine the amount of oxygen in the blood. Urine tests may be performed to check blood, chemicals, bacteria, and cells for infection or other abnormalities. Types. It is urine test, main of them, uh, blood test, and very important, testing for tumor markers. Urine test. It is urinalysis laboratory examination of urine for, uh, for various cells and chemicals, such as red blood cells, white blood cells, infection, or excessive protein. Urinalysis breaks down the components of urine to check for the presence of drugs, blood, protein, and other substances. Blood in the urine, we name it hematuria, may be result of benign, non-cancerous condition, but it can also indicate an infection or other problems. High levels of protein in the urine, we name it protein urea, may indicate the kidney or cardiovascular problems. Blood tests. Uh, they are offered to use a check cell counts, measure various blood uh, chemistries and markers of inflammation and genetics. What types of blood tests? It is a huge number of different blood tests. Here I write for you main of them. It is anti-nuclear antibodies, blood chemistry study, blood lipid profile, uh, brine natriuretic peptide testing. Complement, com a complete blood count or CBC, creatinine levels, C-reactive protein, erythrocyte sedimentation rate, fecal occult blood test, genetic studies, hematocrite, liver function test, peripheral blood smear, rheumatoid factor, sedimentation rate. And tumor markers. They are substances either released by cancer cells into a blood or urine or substances created by the body in response to cancer cells. Tumor markers are substances either released by cancer cells into a blood or urine or substances created by the body in response to cancer cells. Tumor markers are used to evaluate how well the patient has responded to treatment and to check for tumor recurrence. Research is currently being conducted on the role of tumor markers in detection, diagnosis and treatment of cancers. According to National Cancer Institute, tumor markers are useful in identifying potential problems, but they must be used with other tests for the following reason. People with benign condition may also have elevated levels of these substances in the blood. Not every person with a tumor has tumor markers. Some tumor markers are not specific of any one type of tumor. Instrumental methodics of diagnostic. Instrumental methods of diagnostic are widely used for more accurately determine pathological changes in the body and conduct in early diagnosis. This allows timely and maximum effective therapy and predict the course of the disease. What types of instrumental studies we can use in internal medicine? Most often it is endoscopy, biopsy with cytological analysis. It is functional methods, it is electrocardiography, spirography, pneumotachography, uh, rentgenological methods, it is rentgenoscopy or X-ray and rentgenography or X-ray study, tomography and ultrasonic methods. All of them we will discuss uh, during discussing different organs and different systems and different syndromes. Okay, now I have for you self-controlling questions. For uh, good knowing, please answer uh, for yourself for this question. What is the difference between, between symptom and syndrome? What is the meaning of disease?
examination methods and their diagnostic value, uh, the diagnosis structure and types, and what is the diagnostic value of interviewing in the patient. I waiting for your questions in the comments uh, to this video on YouTube. Moreover, I ask you uh, for everyone who listening in this lecture, leave uh, your name and number of your group in the comments or in the comments in our closed Facebook group in our department. Uh, and if you have some questions, some comments, please write it here or write it in Facebook. Uh, we try to answer and uh, we will be glad for your feedback for this lecture. And for today, thank you for attention. Uh, see you on the next lecture in our cycle of propedeutics of internal medicine.